Welcome to Ocean Water. We hope you feel refreshed by the living water of Jesus Christ as we help people receive drinking water from the ocean for free. Thanks for joining us for this weekend's message. And if you enjoy it, please share it with a friend. Hi, I'm Ryan with Ocean Water. I'm here today at the beach where I live in San Clemente, California. It's a gorgeous day. 80 degree weather, 77 degree water. It's exactly why we live at the beach. I'm glad you could be with us for this week's Beach Talk. I want to let you know before we start today's message, we have uh, six different Bible reading groups happening right now with the total of uh, 86 people in these groups. This is really exciting because we believe that God wants to speak to people each and every day if we just take the time to do it. We make the space and the place for that in our lives. This takes about 10 minutes a day. We would love for you to be a part. This is also exciting because all you have to do to put a group together is have the courage to leverage your influence. If you'll leverage your influence to put a Bible reading group together, God will help you do that because God wants to talk to people even more than we want people to talk to God. So God will help us do that. Now, we're in the book of Job as part of our daily reading in the Bible together. Now, as you know, the Old Testament is divided into different divisions. Now, the first five books are comprising what is called uh, the Pentateuch or the books of the law. Now, the next several books are historic as they deal with the history of the nation of Israel from the time that they had come out of Egypt and they begin as a nation in that land. It covers the period of history while they're in the land of Israel throughout the Babylonian captivity and through the repatriation, kind of the regathering of the nation of Israel. And the books of history take us to about 400 years before Jesus. Now we're entering into a third part of the Old Testament, the books that are known as the books of poetry. These include Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon. Now they're Hebrew, and in Hebrew poetry, unlike English poetry, words don't rhyme. They sort of give short parallel thoughts or contrasting thoughts. And in this sense of literature, poetry is found in the rhyming of a word, or not in a meter, but in the thoughts themselves. The paralleling thoughts are like rhyming thoughts. The words don't necessarily rhyme, but there is a rhythm or a parallel thought or an idea that is trying to be conveyed. The way of the righteous and the way of the wicked. It says the righteous shall flourish, but the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous, the wicked, and they have a contrast between these thoughts, so you have what we call parallel thoughts. They're building, you know, this is like the Lord is right, <clears throat> the way of the Lord is true, the way of the Lord is just, and so the writers are giving parallel thoughts and concepts. So Job is the first of the books of poetry. It's been considered perhaps older than the book of Genesis, which is as we why we read through, through the chronological part, it's coming up first. And so Genesis uh, and, and Job lived at a similar time. They were like contemporaries of Abraham. So it's possible that the book of Job even goes farther back than Abraham just a couple of generations from Noah, who we read about in the flood. So this is the oldest of man's literature. The expression of thoughts are some of the earliest men who developed and wrote these thoughts so that they could be recorded. We find men from the beginning being pretty much the same. Through our cultures have changed and our times have changed from Job, yet basically the same things that were a problem to Job are the same things that are a problem for us today. The same needs that Job expressed are the same needs that still exist for human beings today. In Job, we have the picture of a man who is reduced, perhaps more than any other man has ever been, to just about nothing. The bare existence, the bare essentials. With Job, it was just a raw existence. Everything that we think is necessary for life, that we consider to be important, was stripped away from him. His possessions, his family, his friends, his health, he lost everything. He even lost the consciousness of the sense of his own worth as he began to curse the day that he was even born. 
Now, when you've lost everything, that is when you're exposed to the deepest longings of what it means to be a human being. A lot of the times we're worried about what are we gonna eat tonight? But this doesn't really deal with the major issues of life. We think about what are we gonna do tomorrow? What are we gonna do in the holidays? Or what are we gonna watch on TV? We fill our minds with a lot of things that aren't necessarily essential. And because we have friends and interests, and these things can become very important to us. But unfortunately, a lot of us spend our entire life thinking about things that don't really matter. A whole life can be wasted in non-essentials. Now, our whole world spent the last few months wrestling with what is essential. Well, it isn't what shall we eat or not, or can we eat it not? But the argument becomes, what is the choice of what we're going to eat? Well, I, I want Mexican food, or I want Italian food, or I want pizza, it's my personal favorite. Or I want lasagna, another personal favorite. But how tragic it can be that we can spend our whole life majoring in the minors and never coming to the real issues of life. Job points us to this. We tend to think about shallow things deeply instead of, and deeply things shallowly. Now the Bible teaches us to line up our days in service to God and others. This is thinking deeply about life. How can I serve God by serving people? Now with Job, it was just existence. Everything was stripped away. The raw person. What are the things that are expressed? What are the cries? What are the needs? They're the basic needs of man and the basic needs of life that are expressed at this point. And Job becomes a very interesting book because as we listen to the cries of Job, as they deal with the deepest issues of life. Now the story of Job is an interesting story and it confirms what God has declared in Isaiah and Job has expressed himself and that is that the ways of God are beyond our finding out. God said through Isaiah, the prophet, my ways are not your ways. My ways are beyond your finding out, Isaiah 55, 8. I don't pretend to understand everything about God. In fact, I gotta confess, I understand very little about God. That's why I worship Him. If I could understand Him completely, then He wouldn't be, then He would be on my level and I wouldn't have to worship Him. But God's much greater, vaster, more wise, more full of knowledge and understanding. So I stand in awe and reverence of Him as I worship Him. Now, He doesn't always do things my way or pick the people that I would pick nor does he always stop to explain to me exactly why he did things this way. Though I sometimes demand that he does, he doesn't even pay attention to my demands at times. He just seems to go ahead and do what he wants to do anyways, in spite of my personal objections. Now I appreciate that because I found a long time ago that I don't know very much. I fit in the category that Shakespeare talked about when he said, man, poor man, so ignorant, and that which he knows best. <laughs> I gladly submit my life to God's will and to his wisdom, and I'm thankful that I can pray, God, I don't understand what you're doing. I don't like what you're doing, but I know that what you're doing is best, so I just keep doing it. Not my will, but your will be done. This is what Job faced. Beginning, it tells us a little bit of a background about him, it says that Job lived in the land of Uz, Job 1.1, or wherever that is. But then concerning him, it said that he was a perfect and upright man, one that feared God and hated evil. Job was a good man. He loved God. He reverenced God. He hated evil. He had seven sons and three daughters, plus 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, and 500 yoke of oxen and a very great household. So this was, he was one of the greatest men at that time and God was really proud of him. He was a good man, a wealthy man, a man who loved God and hated evil. But it said that his children, they seemed to be partiers. Every parent knows what it's like for their kids to party. So Job was worried about this. He said, well, if the Lord 
forgive them for their parting, or if they say something that's contrary against them, God, forgive them. He was constantly praying for his kids like good parents. So we turn this man, we understand that he was caring for his kids. That's why he offered up a sacrifice to them in the beginning of the book. Now we find the angels were coming and presenting themselves before God. And here comes Satan. After Satan's fall, it seems that he had access even to the throne of God. So why does God allow him access? Well, I don't know everything about God, and I don't know. Uh, it's a question in my mind. The Bible says he's the accuser of the brethren, of you and I. And he accuses us before God day and night. That's what was happening here. We find him accusing Job uh, before God and essentially saying that he only is a good and upright man because God has blessed him with all these things. He says, well, where have you been? He says, I've been cruising around the world, going to and fro throughout it, w walking up and down. And God said, oh, have you considered my servant Job? I'm proud of him. God's doing a little bragging here. It's okay for parents to brag on their kids. He says, he really loves me. He hates evil. He prays for his kids. Now the word considered is an interesting word because it's actually a military term. It's a term that is used for a general who's studying a city before he attacks it in order that he might develop his strategy so that he can destroy the city. So he's watching uh, them open the gates, how they open the city gates, when do the people come out, when are the gates most easily attacked. He's developing a whole strategy in order that he might attack and destroy the city. That's the Hebrew word here. It's a military term. So he says, have you been studying Job? Have you been trying to develop a strategy by where you might destroy Job? Just like with us. Now witness God's protection of Job. He says, uh, yes, I've seen that fellow. I've studied him. Not only had Satan been studying Job, but he had developed a whole philosophy concerning Job. He said, listen, Job, who has been blessed of you, he's wealthy, he's got a great family, he has everything a man could, get des could desire. Job is only serving you because you've blessed him this much. Do you feel like you've been blessed by that? Do you feel like God has put a hedge around you? I know I do. Now this interests me because this hedge that God puts around his children, he says he gives his angels charge over us, concerning us in all our ways to give us strength, lest we should dash our foot on a stone in Psalms 91. So God's put a protection around us and he's put a protection around Job. Satan says, well, let me get at him. If you take away his wealth, he's gonna curse you and he's gonna walk away from you. So God says to Satan, all right, I'll let you at him, but you can't touch his body. You can touch his possessions, but you can't touch the man. It's a good word for us. So it came to pass on a certain day when his children were feasting and drinking at his oldest son's house, there came a messenger to Job and he said, your oxen are plowing and the asses that were feeding beside you Look upon them, he killed them all and his servants, and he said, I'm the only one that's left, and I've come to tell you, before he could finish this message, a second servant came and said, the fire of God has fallen from heaven, and he has burned up all of your sheep and all of your servants. It's consumed them. I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. And while he was talking, a third messenger came. And he said, the Chaldeans, they fell upon our camels. They've carried them away. They've killed your servants with the sword. And I'm the only one that has escaped to tell you. And yet while he was speaking, another man came and said, your sons and daughters, while they were having this bid banquet, a wind came out of the east, blew down the house, and they were all crushed to death and their servants with them. A total wipeout. In one moment, his wealth, his possessions, his children, gone. 
Job fell to his face in the dirt and he blessed God. He said, naked I've come from my mother's womb, naked I'm going to return. The Lord has given, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all these things, Job did not curse God, neither did he talk about God foolishly. I like to say I've heard a lot of people charge God foolishly in my life. Now maybe they didn't curse God, but we've all made foolish charges against God. We've heard people say, I don't think God cares about me at all. I don't think God loves me. These are foolish charges. Sometimes because of our circumstances, we're prone to say foolish things about God. Job faced the same thing. He passed the test. Let's go back to this heavenly conversation. Another day, the sons of God were presenting themselves before God, and Satan came to them again to present themselves before the Lord. I have to say concerning Satan, <laughs> this guy has a lot of audacity. I mean, to go and to stand before God and to present himself before God takes a lot of audacity. And yet again, God says, where have, you been, where have you been reminding Satan that he's in control of him, not the other way around? It's a good word for us. He says, oh, I've been going around to and fro throughout the earth. God can't do anything in the world without his, without his approval. He says again, have you considered my servant Job, how he loves me and hates evil? Now, Satan failed the first philosophy of Job. He proved it to be false. So now he brings his second philosophy. His second philosophy is that man's most basic instinct is that of self-preservation. It's probably the strongest instinct that we have. So Satan recognized this and he said, skin for skin, all that a man has, he'll give for his life. You put limitations on what I can do to him. You didn't let me touch him. Now let me get at him and he'll curse you to his face, the challenge of health. And God said, all right, you can touch him, but spare his life. Again, God placing the restrictions and limitations upon what Satan could do. Now, I believe that God does place limitations upon the devil. The Bible says that God will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we're able to bear. You see, God has put limitations Satan didn't go as far, but God says, all right, that's as far as you can go. Now, as far as I'm concerned, God lets him go too far. I would be bothered by all of the things that had already happened to Job. But the devil was acting under the government of God because God places restrictions and limitations upon what he can do. Brings up a problem. If God does control Satan, then why doesn't God just bottle him up and ship him out of the universe? If God is one day going to cast him and his followers into a place scripturally known as Gehenna, or the outer darkness, or hell, then why doesn't God do it now and save us from all of our misery? Well, God has given Satan liberties. God grants that power to him. So why did God allow him to come into the Garden of Eden? Why does God allow him to come into the freedom to bring war against us. Isn't that why God created us, or to give us choice? God created us in order that we might have an object to love and to receive love from. Now, in order to receive meaningful love, there has to be free will. It's a choice. We're not robots. We have a free will and a capacity of choice in order that we might choose to love God. True love only involves choosing. What value is there unless there's something to choose? To have the power of choice and yet nothing to choose would be totally meaningless. So God not only, not only had to create us with the capacity of choice, but also had to allow the opportunity of an alternative choice. So Satan rebelled against God he was allowed to come to man and offer man an alternative choice in order that man can choose whether he wants to serve God or the devil. That's the life that we're in. We 
have that choice every single day. Taking a chance, man might make the wrong choice. Well, if we do, we get disappointed and heartbroken. But did God know that through, down through the years there, were, there would be those who would make the choice to follow him? Of course. That's our choice every single day. If we're going to follow God or we're going to follow the devil. And it mostly always comes back to, are we going to love God and serve him? And are we going to love people and serve them? So could we come into a meaningful relationship of love and fellowship with those who choose to know him and follow him? Yes, we can do that every day. So the choice is still there and Satan is still operating in order to encourage us to tell us to take the alternative view to follow him. But the fact that we can resist the devil and the temptations and the seductions and allurements and enticements that we face every day shows our faith in God, that we can choose to follow God, his word. When we follow after our own lust and our own desires, that's following the devil. Now the fact that we resist those temptations and we still love God and we gather and we worship God, and we sing and we praise God, we meditate on his word, we hang out with other believers, this is extremely meaningful and bring God's great joy because it's a reminder every day that we're choosing to live a godly life. So every day, this drama plays out in real time. Every day, 24-7, in every language, in every culture, in every country. There are a lot of attractive, alternative decisions, but we must make the choice, and God is honored when we make that choice, the right choice. Now Satan then, is a tool that God uses. God has placed him under certain restrictions and he's still under those restrictions. However, Job is now afflicted with boils all over his body, running sores. He takes a piece of broken pottery and he starts to scrape his body. This is painful, it smells, it's loathsome. He sits in a bed of ash. He said it was impossible to sit down. He was in so much pain. Wow. To add insult to injury, <laughs> His wife comes to him and sees everything that he's been through and everything that he's been reduced to. <clears throat> he says, why don't you get over with it? Why don't you curse God and die? Not great timing. His wife's words. The moment of total despair and discouragement. But it happens. She says to him, why don't you curse God and die? But he said to her, you speak as a foolish person. So shall we receive only good from the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? That is the most mature perspective and the most godly perspective that we can have in life. We get both. Nothing is perfect until we get to heaven. We live in a broken planet. We live in a broken world. Very hard to get to that frame of mind in life. But that's the most godly perspective that we can have. Now his friends came to him, he said when they saw him, they didn't even recognize him. They were so shocked that they began to weep, Job's friends. They tore their clothes, they sat down weeping. For seven days and nights, they sat there, no one said a word, because their grief was extremely great. That's the best part of this book. His friends came to him. You know, God comes to us. It's one of the reasons why every week we end in a prayer where we ask God for his help to come into our lives. Would you pray with me right now? Can you say, God, thank you for this day. Thank you for a new day to follow you. I turn away from my sin and my foolishness. I know I fall short. Help me today to follow you. Help me this week to follow you. Help me to listen to you today through your word, to follow your word, to be like Job, to cling to you, to cling to my integrity, to accept both good and evil, as from you, in Jesus' name, amen. Now I want to thank those of you who support Ocean Water. I put together a short one-minute clip of our friend Papo in El Salvador talking about the work that we've been doing there. I'd like to show this to you, and after you watch it, whatever good God puts on your heart, 
please jump in and contribute. I hope where well, Ryan, you know, we met about so five years ago and since you first told me about the project, you know, at first, um, all my thoughts were like, this is incredible, you know? All, like, in all of our community, we, us, you know, you've probably talked to some people already, we have such a, a crisis with water. Like, rainy season is not as much, but once we hit the summer, just like six, seven months, it's like very hard for a lot of people to get water. So the fact that we will be able to now come over and get some water and then families can have water for say now basic stuff and like sanitation and you know drinkable water it's very it's very important and I just think it's such an amazing project that people will really be happy about. If you'd like more information about Ocean Water Church how to join us on an upcoming trip, how to be part of one of our clean water projects, how to financially support our movement, or even information on how you can start an ocean water church yourself. Please look us up at oceanwater.com.